I'd love to welcome Aaron Kimball here, who's the CTO of Zymogen. Take it away. Thanks. Thanks, Aaron. So as mentioned, uh, I'm the CTO at Zymergen, and at Zymergen, uh, you're going to see a, a bit of a different talk, a little twist on a similar subject that we've been talking about. Uh, we are also modifying biology, uh, but instead of focusing predominantly on making therapeutic drugs, uh, I'm here to talk about stuff. Uh, we make microbes that make stuff. Um, and you know, many of us in this audience are, are centered on digital innovations. But there's a lot of stuff all around us, even in the digital world. Uh, the chairs you have to sit on, the computer screens that you look at, or the phone in your pocket, the cars, airplanes that brought us here, the shampoo you used in the shower, lots, lots more. So today, uh, this talk is going to center on how stuff gets made, what we can make in the future, and how AI and machine learning can play a role with that in conjunction with biology. Today. Most stuff gets made from petroleum. And it gets made in a facility that looks something like this. We crack the petroleum apart into smaller uh, monomers and then recombine them into polymers. And those form the sort of scaffold of all of our products that we take for granted today. Everything from plastics to shampoo and skin lotion, medical technology, fertilizer. And this innovation is starting to slow down. This graph shows polymers that are introduced by decade, uh, going back uh, to about the 1920s. And the size of each bubble there represents a different polymer and its, its market cap, the amount of that polymer that gets sold. And so for something like PVC, uh, the pipe material, you know, we sell and we make a lot of that. And the same is true of PET, which is another very common plastic. And all these plastics that we generated through the 70s are in widespread use. And since then, you only see a handful of very small dots. And these polymers that we've made more recently uh, only have a sort of niche effect. They're only used in very specialty circumstances. And so the world is not getting to take advantage of novel polymers very much anymore. And the reason for that is because there's not a whole lot underlying sort of raw material to work with. The molecular diversity that you can find in a barrel of oil it's quite limited. You have these simple building block monomers, like the ones shown on this slide. And you can only recombine those monomers in so many ways. And so if you're looking for a novel plastic, a new film, or a coating, or a synthetic fiber, all of these are polymers. And predominantly, we have to make all these polymers from this relatively constrained palette of molecules. And these monomers and these polymers that get made from them are not meeting today's needs. Uh, the sort of latest uh, forerunner in, in foldable phone technology is uh, you know, not living up to the promise uh, that we were told that it would deliver. So you know, building a foldable or a bendable display is a really hard challenge. It needs to be hard. You can't scratch it. You don't want it to dent if it falls. But it also needs that flexibility that enables the folding itself. And these two uh, capabilities are somewhat in tension with one another. And so trying to build a polymer from simple monomers that would uh, meet these uh, sort of opposing needs is, is something that we're struggling with today. So petroleum isn't meeting this challenge. Where are we going to look next? Biology can make many wondrous molecules. There are hundreds of thousands of different molecules uh, that are manufactured today by nature. They're manufactured in dirt or in rainforests. Uh, or in other places that are not easily accessible to us. But enzymes, uh, proteins like the ones James was talking about, are capable of uh, breaking down molecules and then recombining them into new molecules with many different properties. And unlike the, the hydrocarbons that you saw in the, the example from the barrel of oil, uh, these can have many other interesting properties. They can involve atoms beyond carbon and hydrogen. You can in include nitrogen or sulfur and other atoms that provide different properties. They could have multiple functional groups, uh, which combine two different properties into the same molecule. They can also uh, create molecules with chirality, uh, a handedness for the molecules, like the difference between a British car and an American car, where everything is, is flipped. And a different car has a better fit for purpose on a, on a different roadway. And similarly, different chiral forms of the same molecule can have very different effects. But if you try to synthetically produce chiral molecules, 
uh, you wind up getting a mix of both of them. But nature is excellent at producing the specific chiral forms that are most useful. So this molecular production has been going on for millions of years, but only today are we really starting to be able to harness it uh, to change the world around us. Petroleum products brought us the industrial age. Plastics, the jet airliner, powerful medicines. And that industrial age innovation started stalling in the 70s, but at that same time we started to see a revolution in silicon technology, which brought us the information age. Now we're starting to see certain limits approach in computing as well. Clock speeds aren't getting measurably faster. The data density on disks is also starting to slow uh, in growth. We're, we're approaching the atomic limits of what we can manufacture in silicon wafers. But the innovations of these previous revolutions have brought us cheap DNA sequencing, big data, and robotic automation. And the confluence of these together can help us bring about a new biological age. Now, a biological age is not just made by advancements in biology alone. We have to have several technologies uh, you know, brought into, into one facility. The cheap and reliable DNA sequencing, as well as the powerful, precise gene editing technology and the ability to apply that to living cells. Digital innovations like cloud computing and the ability to store and analyze the large volumes of data that would come from these experiments and the mathematical innovations that give us AI technology. And so all of this allows us to look ahead to a new tomorrow, but how exactly do we realize it? The answer is as simple as fermentation. It's pretty much the same process that we use to make beer or wine. You have a large tank and you fill it with a specific microbe, and then you feed that microbe sugar, and it digests that sugar and produces another chemical uh, that is of interest to us. In the case of beer and wine, that chemical is alcohol. But by changing the metabolism or the digestion of these cells, you can also get them to produce a whole host of uh, other chemicals and other products. And these can have applications like flavors and fragrances, agricultural products, industrial products like bioplastic, and, and a whole range more. But this is just a small percentage of the chemicals market. And that's because developing new fermented products has historically been a pretty challenging, risky business. And that's because this business is hard. So let's look at some numbers. AI systems can handle considerable complexity. When AlphaGo defeated Lee Sedol at Go, it had to consider a space of 10 to the 360 possible Go board configurations. But the genome is far more complicated than that. If you look at it in terms of the, the actual letters of the nucleotide sequence, you have millions or billions of different positions that can each be altered. But even looking at this at the level of whole genes, you're thinking of anywhere from uh, 10 to the 5,000 to 10 to the 25,000 possible combinations uh, of different genes that can be upregulated or downregulated or modified in some fashion. So you know, where do you start in this, in this complex and sparse space? Many initial industrially fermented products, products like penicillin, were, were discovered being naturally produced. So where are we going to go look for new chemicals now? And if we want to replace uh, products that are used today, like a plastic with a bioplastic, it's very hard to make the same product at the same or a better cost. And so we need to design new materials with improved characteristics. These are big challenges. And problems in these fields are not easily solved with human-driven hypotheses. Here's another more biological look at, at the problem. This is a zoom in on a corner of a popular poster that uh, shows up in a lot of biology labs, uh, which is a poster that describes central metabolism, uh, the core elements of metabolism that we definitely understand. And like I said, this is a zoom in on about 1 16th of that poster. And so if you're going to change the digestion of an organism, you have to pick a spot on, on that graph and say, if we change the gene around right there, that's going to be the spot that improves uh, the production of the chemical that we want. And by the way, it's not going to kill the cell or do something else that makes it unhealthy uh, in the process. Uh, as it turns out, choosing correctly in that map is very challenging. Now despite the challenge, biologists have been making progress in genetic editing for decades. But this progress is slow, expensive, and unreliable. There's historically two methods that have been used. The first of these is mutagenesis, uh, Darwinian evolution at high speed. You grow up a large population of cells, and you expose them to UV light or other chemicals that cause them to mutate. 
And most of the cells turn out to be uh, sicker or they have no change at all that is detectable. And then perhaps one in a billion of those cells actually produces the chemical you want uh, at a greater rate of production. And so when that one in a billion chance hits is an unreliable and uh, hard to predict uh, process. Now on the other side of this is rational engineering. You can do a literature driven search and you can start to understand parts of that metabolism and make hypotheses about exactly where in that metabolism to change. Uh, but this is also expensive and unpredictable. Uh, most hypotheses fail to deliver and you have to build them one at a time, like the scientist shown on this slide making a cell with a specific genetic change. And so you can only test a, f test a few hypotheses uh, at a time. Moreover, hypotheses are built on top of our current understanding of knowledge. And there's a huge volume of genes that we do not know what they do. And so it's very difficult to make hypotheses about this dark matter in the genome. But through advancements in AI and automation, uh, we're starting to see this evolution in the scientific method that we've also seen in these earlier talks today. And so we're working to make these discoveries more predictable and deliver uh, new heights of molecular performance through what we call molecular technology. Molecular technology sits at an intersection of capabilities. It's applied in complex fields like biology or material science, We're relying on big data and cloud computing and machine learning to help direct our hypotheses, and using automation applied to research at scale. This gives us a different way of solving complex problems that isn't constrained by closed form hypotheses. And so, you know, we're starting to now see AI and automation integrate directly with the scientific method. So rather than testing hypotheses one by one, we test fields of hypotheses in bulk, guided by our AI systems. We also think of hypotheses or genetic edits as a search space, and a segment of that space can be designed or characterized as an experiment. We then build all the genomes in that space and then test them in high throughput, analyze the data from this high throughput testing process, and then use that to create a new model of the space, which we then apply to the next round of designs. So we call this process the scientific engineering cycle, DBTAL. So you know, in this new lab, we rely on machine learning to guide this process and perform analysis throughout critical steps and perform the experiments at high throughput uh, using lab automation. At Zymergen, our lab is powered by automated integrated laboratory systems. They allow us to build and test modified microbes at a scale greater than any other lab. And here you can see a few of these, picking colonies, uh, pipetting liquid, transporting materials through the lab, and even generating new capabilities by 3D printing new parts to augment our systems. But if we just built the automated platform, we would then have to have hypotheses to put in that platform, and we would quickly uh, run ourselves dry given the bandwidth of this system. And so we rely on machine learning to assist us with this, but we also need to heavily leverage scientific insight. I wish I could say that I came here to give a talk about how machine learning has this master algorithm of picking uh, the right genes to manipulate in that scientific metabolic map that I showed earlier. Uh, but that means that if we had that, we would have effectively a complete whole cell model. There are efforts to create whole cell models that have gone on in a number of different laboratories, and this typically involves uh, characterizing a cell and particular environmental conditions uh, and using a series of linear equations or, or other systems uh, to explain how uh, modifications like the amount of glucose in the environment would then affect uh, outcomes on the other side of the cell. And for a given environmental condition and for a given genetic condition, we can start to characterize this. But it's always woefully underdetermined, underdetermined given how complex biology is. And so small changes in the environment combined with small changes in the genetics mean that you are quickly outside the predictive capability of these sorts of models. Now, it's also the case that human scientists have a poor track record of bringing products to market in a time and budget that's tolerable, and risks really abound. But by fusing these two capabilities together, we can aim machine learning models using uh, biological insight and collectively use this to climb the system. And so in the next 10 minutes, I want to talk about a sort of set of greatest hits of how we use machine learning capabilities throughout the DBTAL cycle uh, to augment our scientific capability and guide our work. And so let's start in the design space. When designing a microbe or a collection of changes to a microbe, we have to consider how good is the performance of this microbe already at producing the chemical of interest. If we're very low on the performance curve, we lean on different tools than if we're already working on a very mature 
uh, microbe that produces a molecule with high efficiency. And so when we're just starting out, relying on that metabolic map actually does yield a ton of low-hanging fruit. We can use flux variability analysis over a metabolic map to understand how much carbon is coming from the feedstock like sugar and actually getting directed through a pathway such as the one highlighted in green towards the molecule of interest. And by emphasizing or upregulating uh, the enzymes that are on that pathway and working to downregulate other enzymes near that pathway that would steal uh, sugar uh, away from the pathway of interest, we can start to build up uh, towards a uh, higher efficiency. And so this works in early stages of the program, uh, but it has limits. At a certain point, we may need to start swapping out enzymes wholesale. Zymergen has one of the largest catalogs of genomic information in the world, a metagenomic database derived from soil samples. This catalog has been sequenced with very long reads, and it's both a digital database and a physical collection of DNA cosmids. And so this database can be searched for enzymes that are similar to those that are already in a cell using hidden Markov models. Sequences from this database have been integrated into multiple Zymergen programs with beneficial effect. So we can identify an enzyme of interest in a cell that we want to uh, upregulate by basically replacing it with what we hope to be a more efficient version. And we can use an HMM to search for similar uh, DNA or protein sequences in this library and then do a gene replacement. And so on the left, uh, what you see is that uh, we had a, an enzyme that's used in a client's organism, highlighted in purple with a line through it at 1.0. And then we found, using HMMs, 1,200 other enzymes that were uh, similar at the DNA level. And then we screened all of these and found that a few of them had dramatically improved performance. We can also use this to uh, attempt to mimic behavior of an enzyme uh, that might be on the market, and we might be working with somebody else who wants to catch up. And so in the graph shown on the right, the light blue dot represents uh, the performance of an enzyme that a client of ours had, and the green dot represents a competitor's enzyme. And so again, using our database, we were able to find uh, enzymes that had performance similar to the target enzyme uh, that uh, were, were compatible with, with the commercial terms that our client needed to work in. Once we get to the top of the performance curve and we're trying to squeeze out just the last few percent of efficiency in an organism, the challenge gets much harder. We have to start searching over the entire genome and even consider genes of no known function. Now there are thousands of genes in an organism and multiple ways that we could perturb each gene, and so how do we start? We have created a unsupervised uh, learning system based on clustering uh, that uses a Poincaré embedding uh, which is a non-Euclidean distance metric that accentuates uh, distance between uh, elements in order to find uh, tighter groupings. We can do this through genetic similarity, genetic proximity, uh, and also similarity or proximity in the metabolic network. And this helps us understand which genes may be related to one another. And so scientists can pick a, a gene of interest uh, sort of a, uh, pick the cluster they want to go for, and then we can use this model to then predict what other related genes we then want to perturb. We can also improve this model by doing empirical tests on the organism. And so here you can see a visualization of RNA-seq data that shows how genes have been expressed in the fermentation environment, and we can layer this information on top of the network map that we create in the Poincaré space to further improve the, the accuracy or the understanding of relatedness between genes. And these embeddings predict improvement. Two phenotypes that we care about are yield and productivity. Yield is the percentage of sugar that gets converted into our target chemical, and productivity is the rate at which uh, that reaction occurs. Now, we're looking for very small improvements, just a couple of percent, and as the probability of sampling uh, changes, uh, we're more likely to sample things that are on the right, both yield and productivity go up. We're going up on the right, so, so this works. And this works better than alternative methods. This embedded space recommender is a relatively new tool in our arsenal, but we have long-running programs that have run uh, for years, and we have all this historical data to compare to. By simulating random walks over all of this data, uh, we can predict the order in which hits would have been discovered. And you can see all of those as the gray lines. The purple line shows that we would discover hits faster by applying uh, this clustering mechanism to choosing the priority order 
of genes to test for perturbation. So now moving further down the cycle into the build phase, uh, we have to QC the organisms that we build by doing next-gen sequencing on them. And this next-gen sequencing data can be messy under certain circumstances, and we also have a lot of it because we're building thousands of cells. And so we tr trained a CNN to examine the uh, next-gen sequencing outputs, and it can automatically classify a large percentage of our cells as either built correctly or built incorrectly. And it can also do this under ambiguous circumstances like copy number variant and structural variant detection or mixed populations. And so then only flags a very small number of these uh, samples highlighted in yellow in our LIMS system here uh, for a scientist to manually review. After the cells are built, we have to test them in high throughput. And high throughput means using small scale, like those uh, plates that were shown in the previous uh, slide. And small scale fermentation is very different uh, than the conditions in bench scale fermentation. And so creating small scale conditions that are predictive of that larger scale fermentation require that we optimize over a number of different environmental conditions. And these conditions have uh, cross effects on one another. You can't just move a single slider. You have to consider uh, a space of many different uh, capabilities. And the design space of these that one could choose from is enormous. And so we've built tools that help our scientists to do the design of experiment that leads us to the most optimal plate model that is as predictive as possible of our uh, larger scale fermentation systems. And finally, when we've done our job well, sometimes we have multiple beneficial edits available to us. Unfortunately, we can't just combine all of these. Uh, there's a phenomenon called epistasis, which is basically one plus one is less than two. And so our epistasis model predicts how well different edits would combine with each other and then recommends to our scientists uh, the most advantageous combinations of the individual hits uh, that we found through single point mutations. And this machine learning system outpredicts the intuition of scientists. Uh, the empirical results of creating combinations of uh, beneficial edits are shown in pink and green on this slide. The pink ones were created by humans, the green ones by computers. And we're trying to measure across two different phenotypes, and so we want to move a whole frontier uh, up and to the right without sacrificing too much of one phenotype in exchange of the other. And the computer-driven designs uh, were 4% better than the leading human-driven designs, uh, which is a huge improvement uh, for us. At Zymergen, we test things at a lot of scale. We've built thousands of, of strains for each program. Uh, this is a visualization of uh, different lineages created in time over our search for the best strain for just one program. There are 14,000 individual strains uh, represented by a small slice in this starburst. And the distance in number of edits away from the parent cell is shown in the, in the radius. And so in order to find the best possible microbe, we've had to explore multiple divergent paths and then try to combine the best uh, edits from each of these paths. And this mechanism works. For one strain that we transferred back to a client, we incorporated 15 different edits. Now, three of them were on the metabolic pathway. So sort of traditional hypotheses could have found these. The next three changes were slightly further afield. After we found the changes using our high throughput system, scientists could then go back and say, I think I know a hypothesis of why that matters. But we didn't know that hypothesis a priori. The next five changes were in genes, where we believe we understand what the gene does, but we can't explain why that has an effect on the production of the molecule that we care about. And the last four changes were in genes of no known function, just dark matter in the genome. And so we've shown that you know, by searching the entire genome and doing so in a well-prioritized fashion, we can find modifications that you could not find using any other method. And to compare, the blue line on this chart shows our client's progress at improving their microbe over the preceding 12 years. And then in three distinct milestones, our system over the following two years uh, produced another 30% of progress on top of the 7% that they had previously mapped out. AI automation are powerful drivers and can unlock previously unreachable capabilities in this field. As the CTO, I have the privilege of presenting work that is not mine. I'd like to acknowledge the large number of my coworkers that uh, produced the various machine learning uh, systems that have been highlighted throughout this talk. 
and of course the rest of the Zymergen software and data science and automation teams that built the underlying systems that made all of that work possible. At Zymergen, we are changing not only the way stuff is made, but stuff itself. What does new stuff unlock for all of you? Thank you.